Dear intercessors, in this video I will try to finish my series on the mark of the beast. In the first part in this series I laid a foundation from the scriptures that the church will be here during the time of the Antichrist, including uh, what is described in the book of Revelation uh, as the time of the mark of the beast. Uh, in the second part, and I encourage you to uh, watch that first part uh, if you have not done so already, because it is very important to have that foundation. We're not teaching this just to speculate or just to give uh, exciting information about this with the mark of the beast. We are teaching it because uh, it is necessary for us to know what the prophetic word says about this so we, we can be prepared and vo walk victoriously during that difficult time. Now, in the second part of this series, I spoke about the blessed hope. The blessed hope of the soon return in power and great glory of our, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now, it's so important that we have that hope very firmly established in our hearts because that is what will take us through the difficult time during the Antichrist. It will be a very short time, uh, at the most three and a half years, what we can read in the book of Revelation. In fact, in chapter 17, it talks about the, the beast ruling together with ten kings for just one hour that is indicating how short this period will be, but it will be a, a, uh, an hour of testing, an hour of trial that is going to come upon the whole world. And uh, that's why the book of Revelation repeats several times that we need endurance during this difficult time. Let me read from re uh, the third chapter here and verse 10, the famous verse here. Uh, that uh, Yeshua Jesus here is speaking to the church at Philadelphia and he says because you have kept my word about patient endurance I will keep you and then it says from the hour of trial now that doesn't mean that we will escape it but we will come out of it uh, Paul talks about how many tribulations that he had uh, to go through, but from them all the Lord rescued him. He had to face them, but he was uh, rescued from them, meaning uh, he came out victoriously. That's what the same uh, verse here in the book of Revelation talks about. Because you have kept my word about patient endurance. We don't need any endurance to escape the hour of trial. We need endurance to go through the hour of trial. So that's why it says, because you have kept that word, I will keep you from the hour of trial or through the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. So in order to make it through that difficult time, as I said, we need a firm, very uh, secure, established hope in our hearts because that is what will uh, make us victorious to go through that difficult time. Now in uh, part three I began to talk about the mark of the beast and I want to read that passage here now again from chapter 13 verses 16 to uh, 18 in a moment but I just want to say that in part three uh, I talked about what it says here in verse 18 that uh, in order to discern the mark of the beast it says this calls for wisdom let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast how do we get this wisdom well this is what Paul writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and it says there in verse 15 and 16 how you from childhood have been acquainted with the sacred writings this is the ESV translation but other translations use a better term I think be acquainted with the holy scriptures talking about here specifically the Old Testament but it refers to the entire Bible and it says uh, further on here which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith 
in Messiah Yeshua. In other words, we will need not just faith in Messiah Yeshua uh, and, you know, just a general faith and trust in him. We will also have to uh, have the wisdom from the Holy Scriptures because that wisdom is going to make us wise for salvation. And then it says in verse 16, all scripture, that is the whole Bible from Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 until uh, Revelation chapter 22 and the final verse, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching for uh, instruction. So the Bible is like an instruction manual, especially for us living in the end times. And we need the entire instruction manual in order to have the wisdom to navigate in this difficult time. Uh, also, I spoke about, uh, from 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19, that, uh, when Peter says we need to take heed to the prophetic word as to a light that will shine, that shines in a dark place. It is going to get dark in the midnight hour of trial that is coming upon the world. And the light we need in that difficult time is the prophetic word. Peter goes on to say that because the prophetic word did not originate in man's uh, will or intellect, uh, but has been inspired by the Holy Spirit. It means that we need the revelation of the Holy Spirit in order to understand it. It's not enough with our own will and our own intellect. We need to uh, watch in the Word uh, faithfully in prayer and ask the Holy Spirit to teach us. So that's what I spoke about in uh, part three. Now in this fourth part, I will um, go further into this subject of the mark of the beast. So let's read the text here now from Revelation chapter 13, verse 16 to 18. Uh, also, it causes all. Now, it here is referring to what is uh, spoken of earlier in verse 11 as the second beast, which later on in the book of Revelation is also called the false prophet he will be the one that will implement the mark of the beast. Listen to what it says. Also, it causes all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or the forehead, so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark. That is the name of the beast or the number of its name. This calls for wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, or just as it can also be translated, it is the number of man. And his number, man's number is 666, or this specific uh, man's number is 666. Now in scripture, I spoke about that in part three, uh, the number six stands for man, specifically ungenerated man. Uh, and so six mentioned three times in a row, uh, this speaks about man becoming, uh, trying to take the place of God when man attempts to become like God. That's what we can discern from the scriptures. And I will speak more about that in a moment here. Uh, I just want to mention also that uh, actually the mark of the beast is mentioned no le less than seven times in the book of Revelation in six different passages. The first one is here in um, chapter 13. The second one is in chapter 14, where he talks about in verse 9, if anyone worships the beast and has it and its image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand. Uh, further on in chapter 15, verse 2, it talks about those who are victorious over the mark of the beast, those who had conquered the beast and its image and the number of its name. Chapter 16, verse 2, the people who bore the mark of the beast and worshiped its image. And then in Revelation 19, 
verse 20, those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped its image. And finally, in chapter 20, once again, talking about those who are victorious over the mark of the beast and its name uh, and its number. Revelation 20, verse 4, those who had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. So altogether it's mentioned seven times in the book of Revelation uh, in six different passages. In chapter 14 it's mentioned twice. But what we see from these passages is that the, the image of the beast is compared to the mark of the beast, the name of the beast, and the number of its name, and finally 666. It's all mentioned together in these passages. So that means that it's, uh, when it comes to the number 666, the number of the beast, uh, this is uh, equal to what is also described as the mark of the beast or the name of the beast or the image of the beast. Now in, in the Bible, the, a name is always describing the character of the individual who has that name. So that's what we need to watch out for. What is uh, the character that is connected to the beast? Well, we can see that the beast is uh, pictured like an incarnation of Satan. He is going to have the same character as the enemy, as the devil. So when we study the character of uh, Satan throughout Scripture, we will see what the name of the beast is referring to. So I want to go through some of these um, passages here. If we start in the book of Genesis, uh, chapter 3, when we read about the fall, uh, it says here in verse 4 and 5, But the serpent, being a picture of Satan, said to the woman, You will not surely die. So the enemy here is tempting Eve uh, or tempting man with eternal life. That he can acquire that without God, even if, he, if man is disobedient to God. That's a lie. But it's a, a lie that has came already in the Garden of Eden at the time of the fall. And then it continues, For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. That is the enemy's uh, temptation to man to cause man to strive to become like God in rebellion against him, in, in a way that uh, replaces God, to become like God without God. That is the temptation that man fell from for in the beginning. Okay, Now, when we read about the Tower of Babel, um, Babel, we see the same temptation uh, coming here and the book of Revelation makes it clear that this uh, Babylonian society will emerge again in the end times just before the Messiah returns. The same attempt that man did uh, at the Tower of Babel that we read about in Genesis chapter 11, that is going to, what is going to recur again in the end times. So let's read in verse 4 here what the people said at the Tower of Babel. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower, listen, with its top in the heavens. In other words, we will be like God, uh, just as uh, he dwells in heaven with all power, so we will have the same uh, ability. And let us make a name for ourselves. So this was what uh, Satan continued to inspire uh, in man uh, and what we see in, at the Tower of Babel and that is going to occur again in the end times. Then we can read here in Isaiah chapter 14 about Lucifer, which is a picture of Satan. And I'm going to read verse 12 to 14. How you are fallen from heaven, O day star, son of dawn. 
how you are cut down to the ground, you who laid the nations low. And here it says, now, you said in your heart, this is the character of Satan now described. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. Above the stars of God, I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the far reaches of the north. This expression is the same expression that is used about the Temple Mount, Mount Zion, in uh, Psalm 48. Um, beautiful situation is the, uh, the city of our God uh, in the far north. Uh, let's me, let me read that so I get that uh, clear from, from uh, Psalm 48. Because it's the same expression that we find here about Lucifer in uh, Isaiah 14. Uh, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God. His holy mountain, beautiful in elevation, is the joy of the whole earth, Mount Zion in the far north, the city of the great king. That's where the enemy is uh, attempting to establish his throne. He has tried it from the beginning because the Temple Mount is clearly described. That's the throne of God in the earth and that's where he has established god has established his king uh, yeshua the messiah uh, as king on mount zion so the image of the beast is going to be set up in the the holy place as it says in matthew 24 or as uh, paul also expresses it in second thessalonians the second chapter uh, that uh, the antichrist will sit in the temple of God proclaiming himself to be God. It's all the same. Now, let me just say uh, briefly here that uh, this not, does not require for a physical temple to be rebuilt on the Temple Mount for this to be fulfilled. In Ezra chapter 2 and verse 68, we read when the Jewish people came back from Babylon, it says that they came to the house of the Lord in order to rebuild it on its place. In other words, when there was no building there, it was still, the place was still called the house of the Lord. So when Paul says in 2 Thessalonians 2 that the uh, uh, Antichrist will sit in the temple of God, it is referring to the same place that Yeshua, Jesus, is talking about in Matthew 24 when it says, talks about when you see the abomination of desolation. That's the image of the beast standing in the holy place. That's the mountain of God. Uh, and that's where we see here in Isaiah 14, how Satan wants to establish his throne in that place. And he will have success for a very short, brief time in the end times when the abomination of desolation is set up in that place. Okay. Um, and then it, I continue here in Isaiah 14. Satan, Lucifer is saying, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. I will become like God. And that's why he wants to inspire man to be, uh, to strive for the same thing. And in Daniel chapter 7 and chapter 8, I don't have time to read those passages, but that's when he talks about the abomination that will be in the holy place and how. Uh, the Antichrist will speak arrogantly against God. So we can see the character of Satan that is going to manifest in the Antichrist, in the beast. It is uh, pride, rebellion against God, and striving to be like God. That is the number of the beast. Whenever we see this, uh, taking place in the earth, then we can, uh, we must watch out for the number 666. That's the beast's name. Uh, it's his, his number.
the, the name and the number is the same thing and the name speaks for the character of the enemy. It's interesting that in chapter 14 in the, in the verse immediately following uh, talking about 666 it talks about another mark. Let's read about that in chapter 14 verse 1. Then I looked and behold on Mount Zion stood the Lamb and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name on their foreheads. So here we see the very opposite to the number 666. That is this holy people standing on Mount Zion with the name of God and of the Lamb on their foreheads or on their minds, because that's referring uh, to the same thing. How do we get the name on our foreheads? Well, the name is the character of God. The character of God is in His Word. So when we fill our minds and our hearts with His Word and uh, walk in obedience to that Word, His mark will be on our foreheads and on our minds. And in the parallel passage in chapter 7 in the book of Revelation, this mark is also talked about as the zeal, seal of God, being on the foreheads of the 144,000. So that will be a specific company here in the land. But this is something that we must uh, strive for to be sealed with God's seal on our foreheads, which is his mind that we get from the scriptures so that we will not uh, fall for the temptations of the enemy and of the Antichrist in the end times to be filled instead with the mind of uh, the enemy uh, and, and the character of Satan, of pride, rebellion, and striving to be like God. Uh, let's read here in chapter 14 in Revelation what it says immediately after. Um, well, we, I want to read the entire passage here from verse 9 about the mark of the beast. And another angel, a third, followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and its image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand. You see here the worship of the beast and the mark of the beast is mentioned together. He will also drink the wine of God's wrath, poured full strength into the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest. Day or night, these worshipers of the beast and its image and whoever receives the mark of its name. Same thing, worshiping the beast and receiving his mark. Then it says in verse 12, here is a call for the endurance of the saints. Those who do what? Those who keep the commandments of God, the word of God and their faith in Yeshua. We need both. Once again here, the combination of faith in the Messiah, in Yeshua, Jesus Christ, and obedience to His Word, to the commandments of God. That is what it calls for, to be enduring in this, walking in this, in order to escape the mark of the beast. Same thing we find in uh, chapter 13 in the book of Revelation, where it talks about um, uh, how the false prophet will make this uh, image of the beast and cause the inhabitants to worship the beast. And it says uh, in verse 13, it performs great signs and even making fire coming down from heaven in earth in front of people. So the uh, false prophet will imitate what Elijah did on Mount Carmel, but he is going to come with a completely opposite agenda. But let me skip back to um, verse 8, uh, where it says, And all who dwell on earth will worship it, talking about the beast, the Antichrist that rises out of the sea among the nations. 
Everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who was slain. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. And now it comes here, the faithful endurance that we need. If anyone is to be taken captive, to captivity he goes. In other words, some will be uh, taken captive, become imprisoned for their faith. And if that is your destiny, then that is what is going to happen. Meaning not all will be taken captive, some will. It continues, if anyone is to be slain with the sword, becoming a martyr, with the sword he must be slain. If that is the destiny that God has for you, then don't shrink back from death. Be faithful unto death and God will give you the crown of life. But not everyone will be slain with the sword. That's important to understand. Now, then it ends here in verse 10. Here is a call for the endurance and faith of the saints. Same thing, endurance during this hour of trial that is going to come upon the earth. That's why we are teaching this series. And uh, in order to help uh, give understanding from the prophetic word, what it's all about and how to escape this temptation and this snare. Now, I have to say this about the prophetic word, that the entire Bible uh, is applicable to all generations. Uh, it, 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 in fact, the book of Revelation was specific, specifically written to the seven churches in Asia Minor about what they soon were going to uh, face. But it has the word of God, the prophetic word is kept for us because even though it can be applied to all believers in all generations, it is clear that it is primarily written for those in the end times that will see the coming of the Son of Man, the return of Messiah from heaven. That is primarily the generation that the book of Revelation is written to. Uh, because it is a book speaking about his coming, about his return. So uh, we, there will be a final fulfillment of the mark of the beast. Even though the churches in Asia Minor had to go through persecution, where they were faced with a death sentence, many of them, if they did not fall down to worship the emperor. So this was very much real what is written in the book of Revelation to them already and has been throughout the ages. Uh, a warning not to worship uh, any false uh, messiah, uh, any antichrist leader. But as I said, there will be the ultimate final fulfillment. And that is what we're seeing now in uh, happening in the world. I su submit this to you that the book of Revelation is now being fulfilled before our eyes in a way that has never happened before in all of history. Why do I say that? Well, we, as I said, uh, the Babylonian society or community, the global society pictured by Babylon uh, will be uh, this, this uh, empire that will take control of the finances of the earth and forcing everyone to take the mark of the beast or they cannot buy or sell. So it will be a, a specifically a financial system that will arise. Now this has taken place also before in history in uh, Muslim nations. Uh, many Christians have been faced with this because Islam also teaches uh, the same type of financial system to enforce slavery and submission to Islam. But now is coming the final fulfillment of a global empire, a Babylonian society. And today we have such an organization that is called the World Economic Forum which uh, was founded by a, a, man, a man called Klaus Schwab and that meets usually every year. And the World Economic Forum, they are gathering all the influential leaders in the whole world, usually every year in Davos in Switzerland. And they have a very clear outspoken agenda for a global society where you will have to have a mark 
in order to buy or sell. It is now being presented as the Great Reset. And we see that this is truly on the horizon, exactly what, is, uh, what it's talking about here in the book of Revelation. Now, it is very interesting that the main uh, um, ideologue or advisor to the leader of the World Economic Forum is a man from the land of Israel. And I mentioned in part three that the second beast, which is called the false prophet, he will arise, as it says, from the earth, but it is the same word that is used about the land of Israel, in a, uh, opposed to the Antichrist who will rise in, out from the sea, which is a clear picture of the uh, uh, nations of the world, the Gentile nations. So the main advisor, the, clear, uh, the closest advisor to Klaus Schwab uh, is a man here in Israel called Yuval Noah Harari. And I'm going to give further quotes uh, from him. I mentioned some of the quotes in part three, but here in part four, I will give you some more of these uh, quotes from Yuval Noah Harari. Before I do, uh, I want to just mention uh, what the book of Revelation says about the false uh, prophet or the second beast coming out of the land of Israel, uh, that he will have two horns like a lamb, but when he speaks, he will speak like a dragon. Now, Yuval Noah Harari, what is his credentials? Because horn speaks about strength and authority and influence and rulership. His uh, um, credential is, uh, is that he is, first of all, a professor of history at the Hebrew University. It couldn't be anything more innocent, you think, than that, just like a lamb. Secondly, he is a world-known author. And incidentally, the second book that went worldwide, it's been translated at least into 46 languages, uh, sold in millions and millions of copies all over the world. His second book is called Homos Deus, which means man being God. We see this agenda that he is promoting very, very clearly in the quotes that I will give here right now. Remember now the name of the beast which speaks about his character is the character of Satan of pride, speaking arrogantly, uh, being rebellious against God and taking the place of God. So this is what uh, Yuval Noah Harari has said and all these quotes you have, uh, I will give you the reference that you can look up in a video that is pr uh, pr uh, produced about this. He says, what are humans for? And he answers, as far as we know, for nothing. What blasphemy. God created man to uh, rule the entire creation, to, to be the image of God uh, and represent him to rule and reign on the earth. Here he says, man is good for nothing. And he continues, he says, I mean, there is no great cosmic drama, some great cosmic plan that we as humans have a role to play in it. Complete lie in opposition to the word of God. And then he says very arrogantly, as a scientist, the best I can say, this is not true. There is no universal drama with ro a role in it for Homo sapiens, the biological scientific name for humans. And then he continues and he says, the big political and economic question of the 21st century will be, what do we need humans for? I shudder when I, when I uh, hear this statement. What do we need humans for? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, sent him, sacrificed him on the cross. The most precious thing he had in order to save humans, humanity forever and ever. And here he says, what do we need humans for? Or at least, what do we need so many human for, humans for? This is Satan's character of uh, really being 
uh, not just a liar but a murderer. And then he continues and he says, at present the best guess we have is this, keep them happy with drugs and computer games. Talking about speaking like a dragon to totally destroy human uh, uh, people. And then he continues to prophesy here and he says, Earth will be populated or even dominated by entities that are not organic. They don't breathe. They don't have emotions. The potential of artificial intelligence is much bigger than any historical revolution. Let me say this about artificial intelligence and what is coupled to this is transhumanism. It is uh, making people uh, into a new type of species that will be uh, even striving for immortality and godlike uh, powers. And uh, Yuval Noah Harari speaks very clearly about this. This was first spoken of already this uh, phrase, artificial intelligence and transhumanism, was launched already first, for the first time in 1956. And it's an agenda that uh, some people have had for at least a hundred years. But they have not been able to implement it yet because they have lacked the technology for it. Now that time has come when they see we now have this power. And um, this means that we are very close to the mark of the beast. Uh, Harari continues, to learn how to engineer and produce bodies and brains and minds. These are likely to be the main products of the 21st century economy. This is taking God's place as creator. And it's interesting, the angel that came before uh, taking the mark of the beast, uh, warning about the mark of the beast that I just read from Revelation 14. It, call, it calls for proclaiming an eternal gospel. And what is that eternal gospel? To fear God and to worship Him who created everything. And that is what is going to save us from the mark of the beast. The fear of God and our uh, to glorify God as creator. That's what Satan is out to rob God of that glory. So now he says we are going to be able to produce and engineer humans, bodies, brains, minds. And he says we are probably one of the last generations of Homo sapiens, of humans as we know now. Because in the coming generations we will learn how to produce bodies and brains and minds. We are going to create a whole new species of beings. Friends, this is similar to what happened at, before the flood when the angels began to uh, cohabit with the daughters of men and new species came that God had never created. And so he had to destroy the earth through the flood. And this is a picture also of the end times. I continue to quote from Harari here. Now, how exactly will the future masters of the planet look like? This will be decided by people who own the data. Control of data might enable human elites to do something even more radical than just to build digital dictatorships. Now the ultimate dictatorship is coming, in other words. And he explains, by hacking organisms, including humans, elites may gain the power to re-engineer the future of life itself. Humans, he continues, are now hackable enemy, animals. You know the whole idea that humans have a, a soul or a spirit and they have a free will and nobody knows what's happening inside of me. That is over. Free will, that is over. This is what he's saying, that God created man with a free will that he himself will never violate. But this is now what the enemy is going to take away from humans. God will have to step in before this agenda is being implemented. We are living at the end of time, friends. Um, 
we need, and then he says this, this is the essence of the mark of the beast. We need some form of global loyalty and global identity. A global society where everyone has to be loyal to worship this agenda and to take uh, and accept the character of this rebellious society against God. This is what we must learn how to escape, even if it will cost us our lives. Today, Harari says, we have the technology to ha hack human beings on a massive scale. I mean, everything is being digitalized. Everything is being more monitored. Now humans are developing even bigger powers than ever before. We are really acquiring divine powers of creation and destruction. Pompous, arrogant words against the Most High. We are really upgrading humans into gods. 666. Six, six. We are acquiring, for instance, the power to re-engineer life. Now, uh, I want to say this, that the leader of the World Economic Forum, he has also predicted but that by the year 2026, every human on the face of the earth will have a chip in its brain connected to uh, a world, uh, a, 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 a computer system where everything will be tracked. They speak openly about this. Now, it's interesting what Harari says about the corona pandemic. Listen to this. People could look back in a hundred years and in identify this virus epidemic as the moment when a new regime of surveillance took over, especially surveillance under the skin. Ooh -hoo which I think may be the most important development in the 21st century. What went under the skin during the corona pandemic? And he continues, this ability to hack, hack human beings to go under the skin and collect biometric data, analyze it and understand people better than they understand themselves. This I believe is maybe the most important event in the 21st century because once you can hack something, you can usually also engineer it. I think, he continues, maybe in a couple of decades when people look back, the thing that they will remember from the crisis, talking about the corona pandemic here now, is this is the moment when everything went digital. This was the moment when everything became monitored. That we agreed to be surveyed all the time, not just in authoritarian regimes, but even in democracies. And that's exactly what has happened in the last couple of years. And maybe most importantly of all, this was the moment when surveillance started to go under the skin. Having the ability to really monitor people under the skin. This is the biggest game changer of all. What we have seen so far is corporations and governments collecting data about where we go, who we meet, what movies we watch. The next phase is the surveillance going under the skin. Now, he continues, nice surveillance systems are now established these harmless, nice surveillance systems, even in democratic countries, which previously rejected them. We also see a change in the nature of the surveillance. Previously, surveillance was mainly above the skin. Now it's going under the skin. Uh, go governments want to know not just where we go or who we meet. Above all, they want to know, know what's happening under the skin. So they want to have this um, uh, injection into every human being uh, to protect against this pandemic. And uh, I don't know exactly, I'm not a scientist, what is happening with these injections, but uh, clearly the agenda is there to go in under the skin and implement something that can cause this global society to track and to control every human being. Now, 
I want to encourage with some uh, quotes from the Word of God here. The first that comes to my mind is uh, the second Psalm that talks about this Antichrist rebellion against God. Because it says that God, who, he, when he sees this, he sits in the heavens and he laughs. How stupid of people thinking that they can replace me. I mean, God just laughs at this stupidity, but he is allowing it in order to judge those who are rebelling against him. They will have their full uh, hour, so to speak, to manifest their, their complete evil system before the judgment will fall. I also want to quote here now from Isaiah 44, what God says about people like Yuval Noah Harari. I am the Lord who made all things, who alone stretched out the heavens, who spread out the earth by myself. I mean, they're trying to become like the Creator, but they cannot be compared. It's so futile, it's so stupid that uh, what Yuval Noah Harari says, we are exalting men to become God like gods. Mm -mm. Not like the true and only God who is the creator of the ends of the earth. And it says further on here in Isaiah 44, who frustrates the signs of liars and makes fools of diviners, who turns wise men back and makes their knowledge foolish, who confirms the word of his servant and fulfills the counsel of his messengers. Hallelujah. That's what we have in this book. That is the manual that we need to go by and navigate in these end times, because that word will stand forever. Heaven and earth shall pass away. It will be exchanged for a new heaven and a new earth. But the word of God remains forever. I want to make two quotes also from 1 Corinthians, what Paul says there in chapter 1, verse 19 and 20. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? Do not fall for in through that trap that followed the wisdom of the world. Even science is now becoming so rebellious against God. The only thing that will stand is this book, friend. Now, uh, in chapter 3 of 1 Corinthians, Paul writes in uh, verse 18 and 20, Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you thinks that he is wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. What does this mean? What does it mean? It means that in the eyes of the world, we must be willing to be fools in order to be truly wise. Because the wisdom of the world and the wisdom of God will clash in the end times. And you have to make a choice either for the one you will follow. For the wisdom of this world is folly with God, for it is written, written he catches the wise in their craftiness and again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are futile. Okay, so um, I just want to summarize the quote from Yuval Noah Harari and says this, this idea to hack human beings means the same thing as taking away people's free will in order to completely control them and enslave them. That is exactly what he is proposing. COVID-19, secondly, is the beginning of this. I don't say that it's the mark of the beast that has been implemented yet, but it's on its way. And surveillance has now begun to move under the skin through the vaccines. Okay, so what w must we do? Well, uh, we must... Uh, <laughs> Take heed that we give, uh, that we study the prophetic word, because that is what is give us the light to navigate in this hour. And then I will finish here in Luke 21, which is the passage that I return to all the time. It is so applicable 
where it says in verse 36 but stay awake at all times praying that you may have strength to escape all these things that are going to take place and to stand before the Son of Man. Just like Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego in Babylon of old that were required to choose between faithfulness to God and bowing down to the golden image of Nebuchadnezzar. We will be faced with the same choice. And the way that they escaped was by being completely uncompromised in their dedication to God. If God saves us uh, or doesn't save us from the fiery furnace, then let it be so. But he, we know that he is able to do this if he chooses to do so. So they were willing to face uh, that uh, fiery furnace without compromising one iota. That's the challenge in this hour. Watch, watch the prophetic word, watch in prayer and pray for strength, for power to resist what must come, including the mark of the beast so that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. And I also want to add one thing here in Luke 21 that is so powerful. Uh, in, it says um, in verse 25, And there will be signs in the sun and moon and stars and on the earth, distress of nations in perplexity because the roaring of the sea and the waves. People even fainting with fear and with foreboding of what is coming on the world, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. I suggest these shakings have now begun, and people have started to uh, tremble with fear for what is coming upon the earth. But what does it say in the next verse? Then it says in verse 27, And then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And verse 28, when you see these things begin to take place, straighten up and raise your heads because your redemption is drawing near. Hallelujah! The Messiah is coming when we see these things begin to take place. And hallelujah, that's our time to straighten up and to lift up our heads to welcome the Messiah. This is what is referred to in Psalm 24, and I must read it uh, uh, because you will see the parallel here so clearly from verse 7 in, in Psalm 24. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. So us lifting up our heads in welcoming the King of Kings, crying out, Maranatha, Lord, come quickly. That is the gate through which the Messiah will come, because He will not come until there is a people crying out for Him. Just like the entire Bible ends with the prayer, Amen, So even so, come Lord Yeshua, Jesus the Messiah. Hallelujah. That is the cry that we are going to raise in the end times by straightening up and lifting up our heads. Uh, who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. And then it repeats in, again, lift up your heads, O gates. That is the gate that he will come through. That, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. God is able to make us victorious in these end times. Let not fear rule your heart. Have only the fear of God that you are careful to obey what He has said in His Word. That will be your salvation through faith in Yeshua the Messiah and what He has done for us. Hallelujah. So I encourage you begin to read the Bible faithfully every day. Uh, we have a Bible reading plan that you can order from our website arielmedia.se and go to the English uh, website and order. It's only, uh, it's, uh, I should say also on, um, on an app or you can buy the Bible reading plan itself to read through the entire Bible every year 
in coordination with the biblical calendar. That is uh, so powerful to do that and you will build the Word of God into you. The second thing that I want to recommend is my School of Prayer that you can also order from our website arielmedia.se and it will help you to give you the tools to develop a strong personal prayer life in these end times because that's what Peter says in 1 Peter 4 7 as the number one priority he says the end of all things is near be therefore sober and clear-minded and uh, diligent that you may be able to pray thank you for listening uh, I encourage you if you have benefited from this video to click on uh, uh, the like button you can also su subscribe to my channel and also to spread it to more people we want to have a people being ready to meet the Lord when he comes a people that will walk victoriously through the end times God bless you and Shalom from Israel